Good morning, good afternoon or good evening, depending on where you are. So today um, I'm going to talk about a question that has intrigued me for a while. It says, do, the, do flamingos eat Maya fauna? Um, uh, flamingos are quite common in the region of southern Chile where I, uh, where I live. Um, they uh, spend the winter feeding on the tidal flats uh, in the region. Um, and then disappear in the summer to wherever it is they go uh, to breed. So the species we're talking about is the Chilean flamingo, which is uh, Phenacopteris chilensis. Uh, obviously, it's a uh, emblematic species. Um, as I said, it spends the winter here on tidal flats. Uh, in the specific study site I'm using is Kaolin in, on the Big Island in Chiloe, but you can find it on many tidal flats and tidal lagoons in the, in the region and in other parts of Chile as well. Um, understanding the ecology of the flamingos is, is important obviously for their protection. The species is classified as uh, near threatened by the IUCN. Um, from the point of view of a myobenthologist, the advantage of a flamingo is it's much easier to get funding for a project on flamingos than it is for a project on nematodes, um, as they are far more charismatic for the, the average member of the public. Um, also, Protecting the flamingo's habit, habitat, which is important for the local economy, for tourism. There's also shellfish industries in these bays, in Kowloon Bay, where I'm doing the studies, famous locally for its oyster uh, fishery. But also, if, as a general rule, if you, if you can protect the, the flamingo's habitat, then obviously you can protect the habitat for all our Maya fauna uh, as well, by extension. The distribution of the, the species in South America, as you can see, it covers most of the, uh, the southern cone from Chile and Argentina, Paraguay, uh, Uruguay, into southern Brazil, um, coastal areas of Peru, southern Bolivia in the, in the Altiplano. Um, and it goes all the way down to the, the Straits of Magellan and Tierra del Fuego. I've got photographs of uh, flamingos on the Strait of Magellan in uh, in snow um, as for breeding as you can see that the the key indicates yellow but we're not entirely sure exactly where they go to breed it's assumed that they go up to the altiplano to the salaris but for some reason no one's specifically identified where their breeding areas are so when the flamingos feed on the tidal flats they um, resuspend the sediment. Basically what you see is that they they stamp their feet up and down and go around in a circle suspending the sediment and we assume filtering the food their food source out of this suspended sediment. So they create quite a lot of perturbation of the of the se surface sediments of the of the tidal flats. So the issue is is it are they feeding on the myofauna or are they simply uh, moving them around? So this is the video, as I say, on Zoom, it seems to be a little, uh, a little jerky, but it shows the flamingos feeding. They feed in shallow water, moving their feet up and down to suspend the sediment and then filtering out whatever it is they're eating. So as I said, I put the link in the chat. This video is on my YouTube channel. So if you want to look at it, uh, it's, it's about three or four minutes of, uh, of flamingos going around in circles. So the structure of the uh, the, the beak of the flamingos is designed for filtering. You can see this is, uh, shows various views of the, of, the, of the beak. The combination of the surfaces of the inside of the beak and the tongue uh, covered in these little spines which produce an effective mesh for filtering out whatever it is they're feeding on. So in the proximal area of the, the beak they can filter particles down to about uh, 80 microns um, further along the curvature and towards the distal end of the beak, they can filter things that are smaller than about a millimetre. Um, so theoretically they could feed on myofauna. Uh, the, 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 the filtering capacity is within the range of myofauna. This photograph shows how the tidal flat looks after they've been feeding when the tide goes out. It's covered in these feeding rings. So, Imagine the flamingos here and he stamps his feet up and down and goes around in a circle feeding on, the, on whatever it is he's feeding in the sediment and 
the process sediment ends up in this little sort of monticulo in the in the center of the the ring there's a little bit of disturbed sediment around the edge of the ring and then you've got undisturbed sediment that hasn't been fed on these rings are about about a meter in diameter yeah. and as you can see the entire surface of the tidal the flat is covered in feeding rings so they process the majority of the of the, the surface of the tidal flat and so i came up with two principal hypotheses the hypothesis one is that the flamingos are feeding on the myofaunal assemblage and the hypothesis two is that the flamingos are just displacing the myofauna you know suspending them and then pushing them to one side so based on these hypotheses i've got two predictions if hypothesis one is true we would expect the myofaunal abundances in the feeding rings uh, will be lower than the abundances in the borders of the rings and lower than the abundances in the unperturbed areas in case of hypothesis two we would expect the myofaunal abundances in the feeding rings to be lower than the abundances in the borders of the rings but the abundances in the border of the rings would be higher than the abundances in the unperturbed area also the the, the myofauna are getting concentrated in the borders of the rings so sort of displaced so based on those predictions this is uh, the kind of pattern you would expect to see in the data here we have the center of the ring the ring the border and the undisturbed area so if you take the undisturbed area as uh, our normal condition in the case of heat uh, feeding hypothesis hypothesis one which is the blue bars you'd expect obviously the lowest abundances to be in the rain weather feeding uh, with low abundances in the center the, the process sediment in the center and the border in the case of the displacement hypothesis hypothesis two which is the green bars you'd expect lower abundances in the rain where the flamingos are feeding but it, an increased abundance or a concentration of myofauna in the edges in the process sediment also we have got a a null hypothesis which is that the flamingos have no effect whatsoever on the myofauna and any patterns that we're observing are just the result of stochastic variation and if that's true we would expect there would be no significant differences in myofaunal abundances and patterns uh, whether you're sampling in the presence or absence of the rings or uh, because there's six months of the year when there's no flamingos present so you know this is what the tidal flat looks like when the flamingos are feeding and this is what it looks like the same place when there's no flamingos around so uh, we'd expect no differences in in our uh, myofauna distributions uh, in that case so the study site the study site is in a place called Bahia Kaolin which is on the north shore, shore north coast of uh, the big island of Chiloé this is in southern Chile uh, this is Puerto Montt where I am Santiago is the capital for reference and this is a large uh, semi-enclosed bay um, these this side there's a lot of sandbanks that prevent a lot of water movement along this side of the island um, so most of the world's circulation comes in from here the result is that the sediment is kind of muddy um, in nature um, this, this is the point of sampling but there is the flamingos feed throughout the bay So in terms of sampling design, I used a randomized block design with four levels of perturbation. So the four levels are the center of the ring. This is the process sediment, the ring itself, the border where you have an accumulation of some process sediment and the undisturbed uh, sediment on the tidal flat. And this is replicated five times, so five blocks. As I said, the flamingos are not present on the tidal flats all year round. So the sampling was repeated seasonally four times a year, spring, summer, um, autumn, winter. In the absence of, uh, of rings in the, in the spring and summer, uh, we used imaginary rings. So I applied the same sort of block design, but imagined that there was a ring there. Sampling is uh, my standard sampling methodology, which is uh, with the modified plastic syringe so a 50 mil sample fixed in 5% formalin uh, I also took sediment samples for analysis of organic material and photopigments in the in the surface sediments uh, the extraction of the myofauna 
starting with decantation and then then Ludox flotation. I guess the vast majority of you are familiar with all that. Um, evaporation into glycerol and then the entire sample was mounted on large glass slides within a wax ring. This is a method developed at Plymouth. Um, in this case, where you've got samples with very high abundances of nematodes and also quite a lot of organic material, samples were frequently split across several slides, in, in some cases four or five slides, just to make analysis under the microscope uh, uh, possible, because if the, obviously if the density is very high, you can't see where one nematode starts and, then, and, and, and the next one ends. So. In, term, in terms of analysis of the environmental variables, uh, granulometry, I use an emery tube. For those of you who are old enough to remember that methodology, it's very messy. I've now got a sieve shaker, <laughs> which is much, much less hassle. Um, it, for those of you who don't know, it, that's a two meter column of water at 20 degrees C and you time how long the sediment takes to settle out. And that gives you uh, a grain size distribution. <coughs> Organic material, tip, usual method by combustion in a muffle oven. And then the photopigments, extraction with acetone overnight in the fridge and then absorbance. And this is a, a plate reader, which makes life much easier because you can do 99 samples at a time. Um, so it's a very quick and easy methodology. Analysis of the myofauna samples using the, the microscope, a magnification of about 100 and scan the entire slide and count everything that's there basically. Um, it's quite a laborious way of doing things, but it gives you good counts. In this uh, study, you get an average of about four or 5,000 nematodes per sample. Uh, one sample had 18,000 nematodes in it. So that took a while to, <laughs> to analyze. Stats analysis uh, using R, as I said, ANOVA with randomized blocks. Because I made predictions um, as to exactly what I would expect to see with the hypotheses, I was able to use a priori contrast for, to analyze the results. And if anybody's interested, the script is available. So results. Well, gray blocks are in the presence of the flamingos, white blocks in the absence of flamingos. So first off, you can see that with, with no flamingos, the white blocks, there is no particular variation. Um, with the gray blocks, yes, we have variation and at first view looks to support the second hypothesis of displacement. So this is the analysis of variance. Um, there's significant variability between blocks but the advantage of the block design is you can take that into account and taking that into account we still got significant variability with, uh, with the levels of perturbation. So the flamingos are having an effect on the distribution of myofauna. This is in the presence of rings, the absence of rings, so but there's no flamingos, there's no variability. So, so the flamingos are definitely having an effect on the distribution of the myofauna. In terminal, terms of general abundances of myofauna, this is just an example of the data from April 2013. We found 24 different myofaunal groups. Uh, the typical average abundance was nearly 5,000 individuals per 50 mil. And as you see for the table, it's totally dominated by nematodes. 97% of the fauna is nematodes with apatacoids and foraminiferans and everything else is, you know, occasional one or two individuals um, or whatever group it might be. So for nematodes, again, the pattern is almost identical because obviously they're 97% of the, fauna, the myofauna. So same pattern as for the total myofauna and the result analysis of variance results the same the significant variability between blocks, but also significant variability between levels of perturbation. So we have uh, evidence that the, the flamingos are having an impact on the distribution of the myofauna. For hepatocoids, this is a lot more variable. As you can see, the error bars are huge. Uh, the, the distribution of hepatocoids, mostly epibenthic hepatocoids are, it's highly heterogeneous. Um, the white, it's in the absence, but it seems to have a pattern. But let's say with this variability, it's, it's not significant. And that's what the, the analysis of variance shows. There's significant variability between blocks, but the perturbation doesn't have a significant effect. And you get the same heterogeneity in the absence of the flamingos as well. So the hepatocoids are very uh, heterogeneously distributed on the surface of the tidal flat. 
for aminiferins, um, it doesn't look like there's a significant effect there. There's a slight uh, suggestion of support for hypothesis two. Um, the analysis of variance shows um, that there is some effect of the perturbation in the presence of flamingos. So you remember I, I made these predictions initially uh, as to what patterns I would see given a particular uh, hypothesis. That allowed me to develop a priori models for contrasts. And this is the result of that. You can see that in the presence of rings, all the support is for the displacement hypothesis. So the evidence suggests that the flamingos are not feeding on myofauna, just they're just displacing them from to the sides. In terms of the photopigments in the in the sediment, well, in the presence of uh, of the flamingos, there is a significant decrease in the chlorophyll A concentrations in the sediment in the sediment that's been processed by the flamingos. So that might suggest that they're eating microphytobenthos, um, and there are other species that uh, flamingos that have been reported to eat diatoms. So maybe uh, that's the case. Uh, it requires further investigation. The organic material, no variability uh, at all. In the sediment structure, uh, there's a slight variability in the presence of flamingos, which you'd expect with the resuspension of the sediment, the finest uh, components drift off further away. So the process sediment is slightly coarser than the average, but it's, it's not a huge effect. In terms of the ver temporal variation, obviously I only got, in this, this case it's just two years worth of data. Well, I'm just showing one years here, but there is variability over the year. In my, total myofauna, not, it's, it's not significant. In nematodes, it's not significant either, but it's, it's not far off. Hepatagoids show very significant variation during the year. Um, the highest abundances are after the flamingos have left. Um, but their decline happens before the flamingos arrive. So whether you can tie that to the presence of flamingos or not is debatable. In the case of the foraminifera, they also show significant variation, but that's mainly due to lower abundances during the summer months. With the environmental variables, we have significant variation. Um, with the highest uh, concentrations in, in autumn, when in decline through to summer. Fair pigments, which is the degradation products, uh, is the same. Organic material doesn't vary through the year, nor does the sediment structure. So in discussion, well, we reject the hypothesis that the flamingos are feeding on myofauna. We accept the hypothesis that they are just displacing the myofauna to the sides. Um, we also reject the null hypothesis that the flamingos have no effect on uh, on the uh, myofauna uh, distributions. So what else could they be eating? Well, uh, we know that uh, some species of flamingos do eat diatoms. So, uh, and we did observe a, a reduction in chlorophyll A concentrations in the processed sediment. So maybe they're eating the microphytobenthos from the surface of the sediment. Macrofauna, macrofauna are very abundant on this tidal flat. Um, amphipods are 70% plus of the biomass. And a friend of mine, uh, Sandra, she, for her PhD thesis, she fenced off certain sections of this uh, tidal flat to prevent the flamingos from feeding. And uh, she found that the abundances of macrofauna were higher in areas where the flamingos weren't able to feed. So macrofauna may well be the, the, the food source that they're eating. Um, at this point, I would like to mention a paper that was published by uh, Claudio Tobar, who was a master student at our university before I arrived, uh, working the same site. And what he did was he collected the flamingo feces from the tidal flat. And based on his analysis of the feces, he claimed that the, uh, the, the flamingos were eating uh, foraminifera and copepods. I have to say, I'm not convinced at all by, by this idea. I think. Um, Unless you're running around after the flamingos catching the, the feces before it hits the, the surface of the tidal flat. Um, I think that the myofauna that he's finding in the feces is myofauna that was on the tidal flat and has uh, gone towards the feces on the surface. Um, the other problem is, is given that nematodes are so dominant, why would the flamingos eat uh, uh, 
make copepods, which are very low in abundance, and not eat the nematodes. Um, which brings me to the idea of can the, flamido, can the flamingos uh, select specifically what they're eating? Because if they're filtering diatoms, why are they not filtering the myofauna? If they're eating copepods, why aren't they eating nematodes? So there's a question there. Do they have the a capacity to actively select certain prey items and reject others? Uh, that's something that uh, requires further study. And with regard to further study, uh, I'm currently involved in another project uh, looking at the flamingos and the feeding of flamingo feeding on, on a different set of tidal flats, which are just to the north of where of the study site I've been presenting in the Municipalidad de Mauyin. Um, here we have this tidal lagoon uh, called Lenki. And uh, this tidal lagoon used to have two channels that allowed the circulation of water. But after the earthquake in 2010, there was an uplift in the coast, um, which caused this, uh, this channel to close. It's probably only a few centimeters, half a meter less in this area, the uplift, but it was enough to close the channel. Further north, closer to the epicenter of the, uh, the eruption, uh, the, the uh, earthquake, um, I visited a couple of weeks after and the coastline had uplifted three meters in this area. So you had subtidal algae hanging above your head. So that was a dramatic change. In this case, it just closed the channel. Now this guy who lives in this farm decided because the flamingos had started to disappear, he decided he was gonna reopen the channel, got down there with his digger and the Navy saw him and stopped him. And, and they asked us to do a study to try and determine why the flamingos aren't feeding as much in this, uh, in this tidal flat. So, um, I've started that research, the samples have been collected but not processed as yet. Um, and we're comparing this tidal flat with another one at Mot Amotajara here to the north. What I can say is that <coughs> um, the macrofauna data, which is mostly dominated by uh, worms, oligochaetes and polychaetes, uh, shows the same patterns as the myofauna in Kaolin and, and that the flamingos are not feeding on the worms but just displacing them. Um, so I, I don't know what's going on. Uh, there's still a lot of work to, to do <laughs> on that. Um, we're also going to try and do some stabilizer type studies to see if we can uh, 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 get more information. Um, so if you're interested, the, a lot of the results of this has been uh, published a while back um, in marine biology research. I can send a copy to anybody who wants it. And so to finally acknowledgements, uh, a lot of the Analysis was done by my thesis undergraduate thesis stu student, Jan. Uh, it was financed by a university grant. And if you want more information on Maya fauna in Chile, generally, I have uh, my own website, Maya, Maya Chile. And uh, that's a photograph of the central email where I work. So thank you.